Hi, I'm Diego Tuveni from the National Institute for Astrophysics, and I will introduce you to the role of uh, composition in uh, unveiling some of the fine details of the planetary formation process. As we will touch a number of different subjects throughout the lecture, a guiding idea that you can keep in mind too is uh, putting everything into context uh, is that you should think in terms of, of composition uh, or as the colors in a picture. If we have a picture in black and white, uh, which is the equivalent of studying planetary information only from the point of view of the physical processes, we already get a very good image of what is depicted. But we might have some cases in which the, uh, the data are not enough to disentangle these ambiguities. The role of color in our picture and our composition when studying planetary formation is exactly that of disentangle for adding additional details and disentangling these ambiguities. Now, planetary formation is a process that is inbuilt into the star formation process. The collapse of molecular clouds uh, cause the formation of a central clump that becomes a star surrounded by a disk due to the fact that uh, gas falling in falling uh, along uh, the direction of the rotation axis of uh, the clump of uh, the original clump of gas, the cloud of gas, uh, are not supported by rotation and so in fall toward the center, while gas that is uh, uh, um, orbiting along uh, perpendicular to the uh, axis of rotation and therefore on the plane of rotation of the cloud are supported by rotation and form a disk-like structure. Disks are structures that, from a cosmic point of view, do not survive long. Their lifetime is constrained by observation to not exceed 10 million years, and the bulk of disk only live a few million years. Over this time, a number of processes should take place into the disks. But from the point of view of the composition, we, uh, the first thing we need to realize is that disks are not homogeneous or flat structure. Uh, due to the radiation from the stars, we can identify three vertical regions in disks. Uh, Auto-ionized region, which intercept uh, the most energetic radiation from the star, like UV radiation, and therefore the gas is, is uh, in ionized form. A second part, uh, which is shielded by the bulk of the UV radiation from the ionized region above, and it is just uh, irradiated from the star and warmed up. So we have a gas that is in molecular phase. And then we have uh, the central region, which is the colder of the three, the coldest of the three, uh, because it is shielded by the other regions from the radiation of the star. And this region, this mid cold mid-plane, is actually the region where the planetary formation process takes place. Now, what is uh, uh, the thermal structure of this uh, mid-plane of the disk. As I mentioned before, the uh, gas is irradiated, uh, of the, the gas of the disk is irradiated by the star, but in a region of the disk, uh, shield the outer region partly because they intercept a part of the radiation. This means uh, that the disk at equilibrium uh, assume a radial temperature profile with the inner, closer to, the inner region closer to the star being hotter and the outer region being colder. And this uh, thermal profile has uh, been reconstructed for the solar nebula as expressed in this uh, equation. So basically, it scales as the, the inverse of the square root of the distance. And uh, when observation of uh, circumstellar disk around other stars become available with the resolution needed to reconstruct in detail their density, the radial temperature profile, we saw that the dependence on the distance uh, reconstructed for the solar nebula is actually correct. So that the temperature tend to fall as air to the, the inverse of the square root of the distance. However, the absolute value of the temperature tends to be lower in most disks. In some cases, below the temperature for the condensation of water already at one astronomical unit. Now, why I mentioned the temperature of condensation of water? Because uh, water is one of the most abundant molecules in nature, and uh, uh, its condensation basically divides the disk into two different regions. An inner region that is hotter and is dominated by rocky compounds, silicon and compounds, and an outer region outside the water condensation where ices are added to the picture. So we not only have rock, but we have a mixture of rock and ices. 
This uh, dichotomical description of the disk uh, in reality is a simplification because every element in the cosmochemical spectrum is characterized by a specific condensation temperature where the bulk of this element is in solid form. If we take all the elements, we can see there is a progression from the most refractory elements to the most volatile ones. In this plot, you can see all the elements up to uh, the condensation of water. And uh, we can divide them into four main cosmochemical uh, classes. Refractory elements, which have uh, condensation temperature above those of silicates or above around 1,400 Kelvin. We have the main component of rock, or the lithogenous elements, that are iron, magnesium, and silicon, characterized by condensation temperature somewhere between 1,200 and 1,400 Kelvin. And then we have the volatile elements that range in condensation temperature from 1,200 to 1, 150 Kelvin. Volatile elements are in turn divided into two categories, depending on whether they condense a temperature higher than those of sulfur, in which case they are called moderate, moderately volatile elements, or below those of sulfur, in which case they are just called volatile elements. Elements that condense a temperature lower than those of water are uh, called in cosmochemistry the atmophile elements, while uh, uh, chemical studies that, uh, are, um, that originate from the astrophysical uh, um, uh, field of study tend to just call them volatile or ices and group all the other elements as a factory. So you always need to pay attention depending on the field uh, you are in on the exact uh, meaning of the nomenclature. Elements that condense uh, at temperatures lower than ice or uh, are the ultra volatile elements. So we have uh, water, as we say, that condense around 150 Kelvin and we go down for lower and lower temperatures until we arrive to uh, nitrogen, uh, molecular nitrogen, which condense at temperatures that are an order of magnitude lower than those of water. And uh, if we take our density, our temperature radial profile of the disk, and we consider the different condensation, we see that we can build a, a scale of the composition of our planetary bodies. So it, this is a scale of the condensation of material according to distance. And at each given distance, planetary bodies are composed of the sum of all the elements available. So for example, elements condensing at 100 astronomical unit will tend to have uh, CH4, CO2, NH3, carbon, uh, water, and rocks. While elements that condense uh, closer to the star, like for example, around one astronomical unit, will only be dominated by rock and metals. Water uh, condense, uh, at, uh, with, as we say, at around 150 Kelvin. Uh, this means that uh, for the temperature profile generally assumed for the solar system, water condensation falls around three to four astronomical units. And these basically divide the inner solar system, which is rock dominated, the red region of our protoplanetary disk in the sketch before, and uh, the outer part, which is dominated uh, by the presence of ice and other volatile uh, compounds that uh, correspond to the blue region in the sketch we saw out, uh, before. This is all nice and well, but this is mostly at the moment a theoretical idea. Can we verify it uh, thanks uh, to empirical data? Yes, and our first uh, uh, witnesses of the compositional structure of uh, the solar nebula, uh, the, proto the protosolar disk, are the meteorites which are samples of planetary material that have been delivered to Earth and provide us a windows into the condition, uh, um, the environmental condition in terms, of, in terms of composition when planetary formation was taking place in the solar system. So uh, if we look at meteorites, there is a very, very complex diagram with cl uh, classes and subclasses. For the purpose of what we are interested in this lecture, we need only to focus on the main two classes the undifferentiated meteorites, also called chondrites, which are meteorites that uh, originated from bodies that never experienced melting. They are uh, they take the name from uh, these, uh, the presence of these glassy roundish spherules inside them. Uh, and they are, by, they are characterized by the fact that their composition is uh, solar or chondritic. 
Uh, this means that their elements are uh, in a relative proportion that are similar to the ones uh, of the elements in the sun. For example, the silicon to iron ratio is the same as seen in the sun. The other class of elements instead is the achondrites, which means that the, take the name for the fact that they lack the conjures, the sterile uh, that are inside the chondrites, and they are instead bodies that experience fragments of bodies that experience melting, so high temperatures that could cause the melting of the body and uh, the, the um, reshaping of this compositional structure. The composition is highly non-solar and we can have uh, element um, samples that contain only rocks or only metals without the other set of elements. If we look at the elements, one of the uh, family of chondrites, so this CI chondrites, uh, occupy a very special place. Because if we compare their composition, so the ratio of their elements, the elemental abundance is to those of the sun. The sun is represented by the yellow dots and while the orange ones are the ones of the CI chondrites. You can see there is a very good match, a one-to-one -one match for basically all the elements except for hydrogen, helium, the noble gases like argon, uh, night, uh, neon and argon here, and the atmophile elements uh, responsible for the formation of the ices, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. This plot also shows you that uh, uh, there are not all the classes of chondrites have the same con uh, composition. For example, silicondrites, another class of chondrites, while they generally follow the solar partner pattern reasonably well, they tend to have more deviations than CI chondrites. And if you plot uh, the ratio of abundances of CV and CI chondrites, we can see that there is a trend where the elements that are more refractory are more enriched in CV chondrites, and elements that are less uh, refractory, so more volatile, and therefore they condense a very uh, lower temperature, are uh, less abundant. This trend means uh, that uh, CV chondrites uh, form in a hotter environment than CI chondrites, uh, so that the elements that condense earlier at higher temperature are more abundant than the elements that condense at colder temperatures. And if we extend the trend to all the classes of chondrites from the most uh, uh, primordial to the most uh, thermal processes, for example, we can see that uh, the abundance of oxygen uh, with respect to silicon decreases. The closer the meteorites come from the sun, the hottest the environment in which they form, the lower the abundance of oxygen. And at the same time, the colder the environment, the most primitive the material is uh, similar to the solar one, the closer the ratio is to the solar one. Uh, you may notice here, however, that the star representing the sun is higher than the value of CI chondrite. So there is a fraction of oxygen that is not accounted for by meteorites. Meteorites are a sample of planetary, uh, planetary bodies, but which planetary bodies they do they sample? They sample the minor bodies of uh, the solar system and specifically the bulk of the meteorites samples the asteroids. Asteroids represent uh, our relic uh, uh, planetary building blocks from uh, the uh, rock dominated region of the solar system. Comets and transnational objects that are the source of the comets instead uh, represent uh, the relic of the planetary building blocks in the outer region of the solar system, colder and dominated by ices. If you look at the composition of asteroids, for example, mapping their uh, spectra and creating a compositional mapping depending on the spectral type, we can see that there is a gradient of composition across the asteroid belt. The outer region are dominated by carbonaceous asteroids. These are rocky asteroids that, however, are rich in carbon and organic compound and in hydrated material. So they form a closer to the original condensation of water. These are the progenitors of the carbonaceous chondrites, and uh, which are the most uh, similar to the sun that we saw, the CV, CI chondrites, for example. So they, are, uh, they approximate solar composition for everything that is not a nice.
Moving in the, to closer region to the sun, we see that we have another family of asteroids, which is that of the silicate asteroids with different sun classes, the A and S type. These are dominated by rocks, so magnesium, iron, silicates. They don't contain carbon and organics, and they don't contain hydrogen minimum. So basically, we see in the solar system, and specifically in its asteroid belt, the same kind of compositional gradient that we see in uh, meteorites from the ordinary chondrites that are the rocky, more uh, volatile, poor, uh, and more uh, and, uh, meteorites, uh, to the carbonaceous chondrites uh, that instead are the meteorites that form in colder environment and best appro uh, approximate the solar composition. We have another family of meteorites, which is that of the M-type, the metallic asteroids. These are dominated by iron nickel. They don't contain silicon, they don't contain organics or water, and basically are the uh, naked core of a planetesimal that could differentiate, so they could uh, reach temperatures to melt and to create a layered structure like the Earth. We don't have direct samples uh, as the, in the form of meteorites, from the comets. However, thanks to space mission and ground-based observation, we could detect and uh, characterize their composition. And uh, this provides us uh, some indication also about uh, uh, the composition of uh, comets. Specifically, here you can see, with respect to the abundance of water that is assumed to be one, 100%, the abundance of the other molecules that have been detected and the number of comets in which they have been detected. The gray bar represents the minimum value. The green part is the range of variability. So from the maximum to the minimum. As you can see, the range of variability of the different molecules can be of one or even two order of magnitudes for some of the molecules. This means that the comets that we know do not come from a single formation region, but they sample a number of different formation regions that were characterized by different temperatures and therefore contain ices in different uh, abundances. The fact that there are uh, highly volatile elements like CH4, uh, CO, and uh, uh, in some cases, at least in the case of Comet 67P, Churyum Gerasimenko, N2, testifies that these comets formed very far away from the, uh, the sun at distances of tens of astronomical units, probably, uh, where also such highly volatile elements could condense. Can we say something else uh, when we take comets, meteorites, and asteroids together? Yes. If we take our meteorites to be sample of our different families of asteroids, and uh, we sample the more volatile elements, we see that there are trends. We already saw that there is an increasing trend of abundance of oxygen moving from the E-type to the carbonaceous type of chondrites. But we can see that there is the same trend also for carbon and nitrogen, where if we move to more and more pristine types of meteorites, the abundance of carbon here measured with respect to silicon, to the to silicon, increases. However, it always remains lower than that of the sun and uh, that of the, star for, uh, the gas in the star forming regions that we know. That suggests uh, that uh, uh, the bulk of these elements, more than 90% of carbon and nitrogen, is not trapped in rocks, uh, but instead uh, is, uh, remains in gas or ice form. And if we add the comets to the picture, in this plot you can see the comparison with the Halley comet, 1P Halley Comet, we can see that there is a, a huge increase in the abundance of carbon and uh, nitrogen by order of magnitude. However, we are still lower than the solar values and, uh, or at least close but not necessarily matching, and we are lower than the abundance that we are seen in uh, star forming regions, in the interstellar medium in star forming regions. If we add uh, Another comet, uh, like 67P, the most uh, best characterized comet uh, that we know, we can build the same kind of uh, plot. You have the meteorites with the carbon and the nitrogen and the oxygen and uh, the comets and the sun. As you can see, there is a growing trend moving from uh, 
more uh, uh, thermally processed uh, type of meteorites, meteorites that form in the mirror, hotter environment, to uh, more pristine meteorites, to comets, and then to the sun. Nitrogen appears never to be completely uh, captured in comets. There is uh, always a deficit with respect to that of the sun, while carbon and oxygen can be almost completely accounted for in comets. For the moment, we only spoke, however, about composition of material in the solar system. Can we tell anything about the composition of this material outside the solar system? Specifically, can we say anything about uh, whether this uh, uh, information that we are deriving from the solar system have a general validity? And the answer is yes. For example, we can do that thanks to polluted white dwarfs uh, that uh, have very stable atmosphere. So the impact of planetesimals on their atmosphere remain visible for a long period of time and it's possible to measure with a reasonably high precision the abundance of the contaminated elements. These allow to map the abundances of uh, the most abundant elements like oxygen, iron, magnesium, silicon, as well as calcium and aluminum, which are among the main rock forming elements, into the planetesimal that impacted the white dwarfs. And if we compare it to the uh, material of the meteorites in the solar system and that of comets, like Comet Alley, we can see that the abundance of uh, oxygen and the other elements map reasonably well. And basically the variability between planetesimal that are uh, observed in extrasolar system after the impact on uh, white dwarfs is uh, all the same order of magnitude as that of the uh, material in the solar system between asteroids and comets. This tells us basically that the information that we are deriving from the solar system, it is general enough that can be applied also to other planetary system. Another step that we can take is that uh, of applying uh, a similar technique, uh, however, to, uh, to young stars instead of to stars at the end of their life. This has been recently done by studying a sample of young B12 stars. These stars are characterized by irradiated stellar envelopes that therefore are not remixed very efficiently by convection and allow to see um, the effect of uh, material falling on the star, specifically planetesimal accreted for in this case. And uh, by comparing the sulfur to hydrogen and the iron to hydrogen abundances of the material in, uh, in falling on the star. Recent study were able to uh, estimate that about 90% of the sulfur falling on the star is in refractory form. This is basically done because the variability of uh, sulfur maps reasonably well with that of iron, but does not map with that of more volatile elements like uh, oxygen. So that suggests that it is not carried by ices, but that it is carried by ref in refractory form and by rocks. And if we compare this fraction with the data for the solar system, for example, we can see that uh, it matches the information we have from uh, CI chondrites, the most primitive ones, where basically all the sulfur is in refractory form. And uh, it map is, uh, maps also reasonably well with the uh, information that we have from comets, where the, the bulk of the sulfur is in refractory form. There is a fraction that is in volatile form, which originally was much higher than the one uh, estimated for, uh, from protoplanetary disk. However, if we correct the abundances of uh, sulfur in volatile form for the, abundance, the correct abundances of water into the comets, uh, as we saw before, Generally, the abundances of the different elements are measured and expressed in the, as a fraction of the abundance of water. So we need to have a correct value for the abundance of water in order to have absolute value. And if we correct for the right value of the abundance of water, we get that also for comets, we have around 10% 10 per 10 of sulfur in ice form, while the rest is in refractory form, as so in protoplanetary disks. 
Now, uh, I mentioned the ultra volatile elements and the fact that in at least one comet, the comet 67P, we saw the presence of nitrogen. If you remember the table that I show in one of the first slides, N2 condenses at temperatures that are of the order of uh, 12 to 15 Kelvin. So much lower temperatures, a factor of 10 lower than water. And if you pay attention at the plot I was showing, the compositional uh, structure of the planetary material as a function of the distance from the star, you will see that there is no N2. This is because this figure uses the temperature profile of the assumed for the solar nebula. So anchored to a value of 280 Kelvin at one astronomical unit. And in this temperature profile, the distance at which N2 and CO would be able to condense as ices is beyond the extension of the disk. Therefore, we will need to have a colder disk in order to have CO and N2 condense and uh, be visible in, our, in the comets that this disk would form as we see in the comets of the solar system. This can be done in two ways. One is to just have a colder disk than the one generally assumed for the solar nebula. So with a temperature of one AU lower than 280. But this uh, could also mean that some of the comets that we see did not form at the very beginning of the life of the disk when the disk was hotter, but uh, formed the way the disk was cooling down over time. During the life of the disk, in fact, uh, its temperature lower decreases. That means that the snow lines, as you can see in this plot, migrates inward. So, for example, an early format comets forming at 25 AU would be CO and N2 deprived. But if the same comet would form a 2 million year at 25 AU, then it would contain both CO and N2. So the composition of an object can tell us something either about the distance at which it formed or about the time at which it formed. Mentioning time, can we say something about these processes? Is it possible to have a different generation of comets forming at the same distance at different temperatures, for example, as I was discussing before, or do we have a planetism forming all in one go at the same time? We can tell this again, look at the composition thanks to meteorites. Specifically, we can use a number of uh, radiometric clocks. I'm not gonna go into detail about this, but you will uh, find in the next slide the references where you can read more about them. And applying this radiometric clock to the different components of the bulk composition of a meteorite, we can date it. So for example, the dating of the different composition of uh, carbonaceous chondrites indicates the calcium aluminum inclusion, these, like this uh, gray, light gray pebble here, are among the oldest objects in the solar system. And uh, the oldest one of them provided the actual date of the beginning of planetary formation in the solar system, which is 4 billion 568 million years ago. If we date a number of meteorites and we put them on a time scale using the different radiometric clock that can be used, we can derive a number of information. Specifically, we can see that the first generation of planetary bodies testified by these iron meteorites in the red region were able to form, grow to a few tens of kilometers in size, keep their uh, radiogenic heat and accretion of heat, melt and differentiate like the Earth in around one to two million years after the condensation of the oldest solids. So the first generation of planetism was able to appear on a time scale of one million year. Chondrules, which are uh, believed to be uh, molten fragments produced by impacts among planetesimal that then get reaccumulated and form a, a new generation of uh, planetary material and planetary bodies, date uh, slightly later than the oldest irons, iron meteorites, and suggest that there was another generation of bodies forming uh, in uh, two to three million years after the condensation of the other solids. Then we have a large families of differentiated meteorites that formed over a larger uh, range of times. Okay, saying that formed over a large range of times is not correct because uh, the radioactive uh, dating methods used to date these meteorites are able to tell you when uh, uh, the 
silicate part, the lighter silicate part, separate from the heavier iron part, and the first form the crust and mantle of the planetary body, while the second one, the iron part, form the core. So they provide a lower limit to the time of formation, well, upper limit to the time of formation, because by the time the body differentiated, it should have already formed and had the time enough to accumulate it and melt. So we have indication that uh, planetary bodies formed uh, over the whole lifetime of uh, the protoplanetary disk around the sun. Can we say something about the comets? No, because we don't, we can, we don't have large enough samples uh, that we can use to date with the same kind of uh, details. However, as I mentioned before, the composition of comets provide us some hints that uh, a similar situation as the one described by meteorites was valid also for comets. We know that they were able to condense and form uh, even at large distances because some of them contain CO and in the case of comets 67P also N2, which condense at larger distance or later time. And we have different ratio of CO, CO2 and H3 that suggests that uh, the, the comets that we know formed across a wide region where uh, that was characterized by different ratio and abundances of the different ices. Therefore, we can uh, um, derive from this information that icy planetesimal formed of a wide range of orbital regions or an extended temporal interval or a mixture of the two. We will stop here for a moment uh, now that we have uh, an idea of uh, the colors with which uh, we can depict our picture. And in the second part uh, of this uh, lecture, we will see instead what are the effects of the planetary formation process on the picture described until now. So grab a coffee, get some uh, time to get your idea together. And when you're ready, we can join and uh, we can start with the second part.